Yeah, we're real big on content marketing. That's our big thing. So we put a ton of effort. We write about a blog post a week, post it to the site, and then we'll promote that on social media. We write those project case studies we talked about. And again, we'll promote those on social media. But the whole marketing strategy for us is rank well organically and drive and drive traffic to the website. We've put a lot of effort into the website to make sure it's a really good tool for our clients to understand us and to do research about remodeling in general. And so that's worked very well for us, you know, you know, to date. You're listening to the Remodeler Digital Playbook, a show created to inspire remodeling contractors to achieve success in their remodeling business. I am your host, Ratna Ramakrishnan. I'm also the founder of Remodeler Digital, the digital marketing agency for remodeling contractors. In each episode, I'll be chatting with remodeling contractors and top experts discussing their proven methods for revenue generation, the insights they've gained, and the keys to remodeling success. And I'll be sharing my knowledge of how I created a seven-figure business using digital marketing. We are in for a treat at the Remodeler Digital's Playbook podcast today with Paul McManus from Tallahassee, Florida. He has a background in architecture. He's an avid traveler and he's a remodeling contractor. I am so excited to have you on the podcast and I can't wait to get to know you as well as how you work as a remodeling contractor. Thanks for taking the time, Paul. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Very cool. So let's dive first right into work and then we'll talk about your personal story. Although I'm very excited to hear about your personal story. It's just so fast, sure. fascinating how much you've traveled and your, your bicycle expeditions and so forth. So uh, tell me a little bit about what got you into the remodeling industry because you have, you do have a background in architecture. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't come from a family of remodelers or anything. What happened was, in college, I just started working for a painting contractor, uh, kind of as a summer job. And I kind of got the bug. That painter, that guy actually went out of business <laughs> uh, under sort of less than ideal circumstances. But it worked out for me because he gave me all his equipment uh, as kind of an apology for leaving me high and dry. And so I just started my own painting company college. And so I ran that through college. And then after college, I kept going and it evolved into a handyman business. And then I got my contractor's license and, you know, the rest is history. So today you do all kinds of remodeling, kitchen and bathroom and um, additions. What is popular in the Tallahassee area in Florida today? Oh, you mean as far as projects, yeah. types of projects? Yeah. Oh, I mean, we specialize in kitchen and bath. So we tear out a lot of those old uh, jacuzzi tubs and replace them with bigger showers. That's probably one of our more popular bathroom remodels. Um, kitchens down here, everyone still wants the open kitchen mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pretty Tallahassee is a pretty traditional, kind of more conservative area from a design <coughs> point of view. So we do kind of a lot of more traditional kitchens and stuff. Nice. And do you have a showroom? We do. And, um... How do you find the products that you show off or showcase in your showroom? Do you tie yourself to just the classic, you know, bigger brands or do you build relationships with smaller um, vendors, producers? Like what, what will I see if I were to walk into your showroom as a homeowner? Uh, well, we specialize in frameless cabinetry, which is a little unique in Tallahassee. Um, frameless cabinetry is obviously very popular across the world, but in <clears throat> Tallahassee and in America in general, framed cabinets are certainly more common. Um, so we work with both well-known brands and boutique uh, brands. We're always looking for unique and original things to bring into the showroom. We like to show people stuff they haven't seen anywhere else. Ooh. You know what I mean? Bring them something new. Uh, so when, anytime someone comes in the showroom, we're always hoping to show them something they haven't seen before. So when you say a uh, uh, frameless cabinetry, is that the one that ha that's capable of like the funky openings, like a Tesla door, or what is? You can do bifold. Yeah, you can do bifold lift up doors, and uh, we like frameless cabinetry because you can do some unique 
organizers in it and unique doors. Um, we feel like it's a cleaner look. And you also get, per per sort of linear foot of cabinet, you also get more storage. Because I you don't have that frame around the cabinet taking up space. So do you regard yourself a design and build contractor? Do you have a designer team in-house that actually draws and does the 3D renderings for your um, clients? Yeah, we have two designers on staff. Um, we have a couple of project managers and then some support <coughs> staff you know, design assistants, a warehouse manager, stuff like that. Was there a certain point in time when you decided to become a design and build contractor? Where, or were you, because design is, is a little bit more intense where you need the team, you need to present it, and then there's going to be adjustments and costing and estimation for, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. So was there a point in time when you were just a, um, a builder, a contractor, and then you added the design part to it? Or You've always been a design build firm. No, we started the design build approach in 2015. Um, prior to that, I was pretty much just a, a, like a lot of contractors in town where I would work with other designers. Um, and, you know, we'd visit all the different showrooms in town. We didn't have our own showroom. Uh, I was always involved in the design because of my background in architecture. Mm -hmm. I've always done a lot of the initial design work, at least, before we handed it off to a uh, a cabinet company or a designer. And then I just, I'm kind of a control freak. And so I got frustrated with delays from people not ordering stuff mm -hmm. or not having the stuff I wanted because they just didn't, you know, they didn't just have very broad product lines or limited designs, sort of what I felt like were limited visions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we decided to open up our own showroom and design center and and do that stuff ourselves. Very cool. So one of the things I caught on your um, website or information about your brand is that you offer a good, better, best kind of a budget model. And how does yeah. how has this helped you streamline your decision making process for your clients, for your homeowners? Well, I think most people want options. Like most of our <laughs> clients, they've only remodeled once before or maybe never before. They don't really have a budget. They're not really sure what things cost. They're not really even sure what the possibilities are. And so our process is all about just helping them explore that. Nice. And so by showing them good, better, best choices, and good, better, best is really all about material choices. Mm -hmm. There's really no, we don't really do good, better, best labor. Of course. We kind of do labor one way. And that's <laughs> true. The best we can. Um, but by showing them the options and just, you know, helping them understand what's the difference between a, a good cabinet and a better cabinet and a best cabinet, you know, they can make the smart choice for their needs um, instead of locking them into to a choice without without consulting them. Nice. So let's pretend you have a brand new lead that has come in from whatever source, your website, or I don't know if you do any paid lead generation. What is the experience that that lead goes through? Do they go through a phone appointment and then an in-house estimate appointment? And what does that process look like for you to take a lead and convert it into a client and then put, you know, money in the bank, revenue, make revenue for yourself? Yeah, sure. So we start with a, just what we call a discovery call, which is a pretty quick call just to learn about, you know, their needs and explain how we work. Um, from there, we do what we call a design and budget consult. Uh, which is really, it's two meetings. So it starts with me going out to their home to take a look and get um, accurate measurements. We actually scan the home with a 3D software tool to get our initial measurements. Um, after that meeting, we'll have them come into the showroom. We'll have prepared a 3D concept drawing of what we think the new space might look like, as well as that good, better, best budget to go with the concept. And then we'll sit together for about an hour, hour and a half, and we'll, we'll discuss the concept and we'll discuss the budget and we'll adjust it based on their needs. Uh, and then at the end of that meeting, we decide if we want to move forward into design or if they want to go home and think about it or, or whatever the appropriate next step might be. So this entire approach, this entire strategy is free or do they pay you at any point in time to uh, for your team's time? And we do charge. Yeah. At what point? Do yeah, you we charge? charge a fee for our yeah, so the initial home visit and showroom visit, we charge a fee anywhere from $225 to $575, just depending on the scope of work. And then if they were to go with you, then you'd just apply those fees to the project value. 
Yeah, that's a, it's a credit on the project, yeah. So do, do, you, do you feel this is a friction point? Because this is one of the things that I recommend to my contractors and many of them say, no, this is not going to work out. And uh, how did you make that decision mm -hmm. to, because you're valuing your time and I'm sure you're, you're giving them a really good estimate and you know, clarity on what they want to do because remodeling is, is, is not for the faint of heart. It takes time and effort and mm -hmm. your, your life is going to change when you have remodeling done in your home. So how did you arrive at that point where you said, you know, th this is worth $300, $500 and your, your clientele is open to paying that? The, I mean, sorry, you, we've been charging a fee for probably close to 10 years. Nice. It started, you know, it started real small, really just to sort of eliminate people who weren't serious. Like mm -hmm. you said, kind of trying to avoid wasting our time. I think I started charging $25 back 10 years ago. That's, That's what I charged, sweet. you know, which, which thinking about it, it feels like silly, but that's how we started. And then at one point, then someday I changed it and it was $75 and then it became $125. And every time we raise prices on how much the console costs, what we're really doing is we're, we're adding value into the console process. Like the whole idea is yes, we're charging a fee, but what that allows us to do is spend more time and effort on creating a better proposal mm -hmm. and you know, of doing a better job at helping them understand their options. So it's in my mind, it's a real win-win. They get a much better experience and a much more accurate estimate and a better you know, the, uh, initial process. And then we get compensated for our time. Although I'll tell you, we're not compensated 100%. Right. It still costs me more to create that proposal than we are charging. I can imagine. Um, it, but it does it does eliminate some people who don't want to pay. There's a little bit of friction. Um, but our the right clients, you know, the clients who want to work with a contractor like us, um, they don't mind at all. Most people are, totally understand, they get the value. Um, and the ones that don't, you know, there are other contractors that are, you know, might be a better fit for them. Nice. So you do have foot traffic that comes to your showroom then people can just walk by and no we're appointment only i see yeah so then so yeah, we do get people walking in but we're not very many we're we're it says right on the door appointment only i see very cool so um considering you're you know putting together this proposal and it's a paid you know appointment do you use a certain tech stack do you have certain tools that you like that you're using to keep your business moving forward be it you know mm -hmm. when leads come in from your website or for design and estimation and you know if you were to pick three to five of your top favorite tools what would they be and why do you like them i mean we use builder trends for all of our project management so that's our that's our crm and if they move forward into uh design and build that's our that's our project management tool um we use canvas which is a 3d scanning tool to capture all of our as builts so we'll scan we'll scan a room We'll send it to Canvas and they send us back a CAD drawing uh, and then we're able to create the initial concept from there. Um, we use spreadsheets, like our, our initial estimates are built on a pretty robust spreadsheet that we've created, um, built on Google Sheets. Those are probably our three main bits of technology. We're big on scheduling things. So all of our meetings are scheduled with clients in advance. And so we use Acuity uh, scheduling software for that. Uh, that helps kind of streamline things and keep things on track. Um, and then yeah, those are those are definitely our main. Ones. But in remodeling, where are you holding your open leads, right? Leads that have come in that are kind of still not made a decision, but you know they're a qualified lead, a valid yeah. homeowner. What is your process in making sure that you know you you continue to stay in conversation with them? Because unconverted leads is the number one challenge in the uh, re you know the the time to the speed to connection and what are some of the things that you. Mm -hmm top of mind with your open leads so we we use builder trend for that so builder trend has a crm built in um and we have a series of templated emails um so when someone contacts us we speak on the phone we we send them an email with a scheduling link so they can schedule that initial home visit um, a few days later they'll get an, an, another email from us uh, with some information about the company, like our license and our insurance. Uh, a few days after that, if they haven't scheduled, they'll get a reminder from us. So we have sort of things like this built in. Templated. Same when we, 
we send them a link to schedule their showroom visit after the home visit. There's an email series they get that kind of explains to them what to, what to expect um, and prepare them for that appointment. And then after they've gotten their budget from us, we have a follow-up series of four or five emails that go out over the course of, you know, four to six weeks um, until they decide they want to move forward or they don't want to move forward or, or whatever. And then all clients will go into our newsletter list mm. and we send out a newsletter one, uh, six times a year. Nice. Um, so, uh, And that's a, just a, a way to stay top of mind with people who haven't decided to move forward yet. Um, just stay in touch with past clients. So you're just like tooting your horn and talking about your uh, completed projects and things in your newsletter. What is the content of your newsletters? Yeah, our newsletter is the same every time. It's It'll be three recent projects. Uh, we do a case study, a pretty detailed case study for every project we complete. <clears throat> um, that includes things like project timeline, project cost, things that went well, things that were challenges, how we, how we solved those challenges. Um, so we'll do a summary of three projects with links to the actual case study. And then we'll include a couple of blog posts, uh, usually seasonal, uh, you know, depending on the time of year. And that's really it. So it's just the same every time. It's kind of templated. But it provides, we get good feedback on it because providing clients um, a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of information without being too overwhelming. Nice. So talking about your case studies, do you have, you know, you've been at this a long time, literally since you were a kid with your first painting uh, gig. But when you look, yeah, yeah. look at all the projects you've done, uh, is there a, a favorite project that you like? Because, you know, remodeling literally transforms people's lives because once you change the space that oh, people yeah. live in, you know, it, you just become happier, more efficient. There's, but is there a favorite project that comes to mind where, you know, it was so dramatic, the effect on the homeowner or the space, or perhaps it was just a favorite project for you because of all the little, you know, details that went into it. I, I'd love to hear. Yeah. yeah, that's a tough one. That's like picking your favorite kid or something. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, I like them all. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Actually, there's, you know, I like most of them. I'd say it's probably easier to name ones that I, don't like. <laughs> what than, the, than, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> elimination, elimination is a good way too. So, the, most of them we really we like them all, but I can't, what, the ones that I was, don't like isn't the right word. Sometimes you you kind of strongly disagree with some of the design decisions a client wants to make, mm -hmm. and those are always just tough projects. It's what they want, and we're very careful about. You know, we express our opinion. We'll double down and reinforce our opinion, but ultimately it's their home. If, if they want what they want, you know, we're going to do what they want. Uh, but sometimes those projects, we don't take final photos of those projects. <laughs> we don't, you know, I don't do case studies of those. Projects. You're not part of it. <laughs> got it. Got it. Well, fair enough. Right. So you know, the bottom line is clients happy and that's what matters most, but we just might not like the way it looks or might disagree with some of the design details that they, they wanted. <laughs> Especially with your architecture background, your aesthetic sense must be very high. So I can imagine if there's a homeowner that's asking for silly stuff and it doesn't align with what you think makes sense, then you're probably yeah. Well, well, and I'm really the, I'm really more of the function guy. Like my, I'm I'm really about the layout, and the organization, and all that. That's my big thing. I'm a little more flexible on aesthetics um, than my designers. My designers are the ones who really are more strict when it comes to the aesthetic sometimes, but cool. yeah, I'm really more about, you know, the space has to work well and I want it to be, you know, timeless and work well for a very long time. So, but it's a good combination between the designers and myself, you know, we, we can put together a pretty good, pretty good package. Cool. So there's a statistic that every homeowner is likely to have a kitchen or a bathroom remodel. In fact, a kitchen and a bathroom remodel in their lifetime. And so what is trending these days when you think about remodel in kitchen and bathroom? Like I know there's those, um, I go to the International Builders Show. I'm a member of the National Association of Remodelers. So I've seen those, you know, touchless faucets and those, um, you know, totos that sing and they have the warm toilet seat. And so yep. what's trending right now? Like what do homeowners like right now when it comes to remodels? Um, natural stone around here is a big, there's a big push for natural stone. Uh, marble and quartzite, stuff like that. Quartz, 
man-made quartz is still very, very popular. It's still see. the most popular. But natural stone, we're seeing a big push for that in a lot of projects, um, especially marble. Um, we're seeing color. People bringing, you know, white cabinets are still around, but we're seeing more people bring color into the into the cabinetry. Wood wood cabinets making a comeback. You know, the painted finishes are still very popular, but we're seeing more and more people gravitate towards wood. As far as things like the the singing Toto <laughs> toilet, we 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 tend to stay away from really trendy things because we're trying to build spaces for you know for people that are going to last a long, long time. I will say like fluted things are very Ooh, popular. Nice. You know, whether it's a farm front sink with a fluted finish or cabinets with fluted doors, um, tiles with fluted um, pattern on them. Um, for some reason, fluted things are crazy popular right now. So very cool. Thanks for sharing that. So this summer I had to remodel my uh, master bathroom due to a plumbing issue. And, you know, I went through the whole interview process of interviewing a bunch of contractors and then picked one. And we're really pleased with the bathroom that we've been handed with. But one of the things that um, happened was there is a, a, a wall cabinet that's to the right of my vanity and there's glass shelves that go on it. And the clips that hold the shelves were part of the packaging and the team threw it away. And we are dealing with trying mm -hmm. to find find the manufacturer. And so it really made me stop and think about like, you know, you're not only in people's homes and for, you know, three to eight weeks, like working through the remodel. And then when little things happen like this, the project is not like officially completed in my head that I was wondering, like, do you have any simple systems or processes to like avoid these kinds of things? Or is this just an inevitable fact of life that sometimes things just go amiss? I mean, it's remodeling. So there's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns, so often things come up on projects that are unexpected. So that's that is normal. However, what's important is how you deal with them, um, yeah. and we do have processes in place. So we want to resolve those issues as quickly as possible. We would never make you go look for those things on your own. For example, we would get them <laughs> for you. You know, um, but we do. So we have we have project managers who are on site every day. And they are doing quality control inspections. They are looking for things like those missing clips. Um, so, the, and they're adding those things to a, a list so we can address them. Um, so that's a sort of a daily task. And then three times during the job, uh, we're doing a formal walkthrough. And that would be the client, the designer, and the project manager, all three together, walking through the project and just discussing things and making sure everything is how everyone expects. Um, and so then we're, we'll make little lists of things there, get those addressed you know, quickly as well. So the goal is to get to the end of the project and there are no more of those issues because we caught them by doing these daily uh, inspections and these sort of regular walkthroughs. Cool. I, I like that three touch points during the project idea, um, which will keep it seamless when the project closes. Yeah, the formal walkthroughs are great. I mean. Obviously, the client can talk to us every day. They can email yeah. us. They can have questions. But, but doing it formally and a good a key is, you know, the project manager is there every day. And sometimes when you see something every day, you can become a little blind to uh -huh. some, some small details, you know. So getting the designer who's there, who hasn't been there in a few weeks, it's a fresh perspective. And so that helps a lot. Sometimes she'll see things that have been there for a little while, but the project manager just maybe, maybe hasn't noticed them. You know, she looks at it from a different point of view than he does. So that's always helpful. Nice. So considering you've been in the remodeling industry for so many years, what have you noticed in terms of trends in the past 10 years with COVID in between? Uh, are people more ready to remodel? I know that there was a huge spike in remodeling with everybody stuck at home during the pandemic, you know, looking at their own spaces and saying, you know, how can I improve the space that I'm stuck in? But what's happening recently in the past, you know, the, the recent um, three to four years post pandemic and what are you predicting as a trend going forward? Lots of swimming pools have been added to homes. <laughs> nice, <laughs> so, why not? Yeah. COVID. I feel like swimming pools were kind of like dying, like not many people wanted them because of the maintenance and, but I think COVID changed that. Now, most people we talk to are either putting in a pool or planning to put in a pool. Like suddenly it's a very big thing. But that I think in general what's changed is people 
want the home to serve multiple purposes. They want the home to be able to do a lot. So they want to be able to have a home gym and a play center and a mm -hmm. quiet space and an entertaining space. They, people just want their homes to do lots of things mm -hmm. um, in case they can't go to the gym, in case they can't go out to eat. They want to be able to do that stuff at home. Um, so that's probably the biggest change. And then more recently with increase in housing prices and increase in interest rates, more people are, people used to upgrade. They would just move to a nicer home with the things they mm -hmm. wanted. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people are more likely to remodel to get what they want, it seems like. Nice. So your project flow has been steady. You haven't seen a lull or a spike or... We've been, we've been pretty consistent um, for quite a while. Um, you never know, you know, cross, cross fingers, knock on wood, um, what's around the corner, but we've, we've done pretty good, staying pretty steady, growing at a pretty, pretty moderate, you know, 10% or so every year. Very cool. So considering I'm a digital marketer and I work exclusively with remodeling contractors, I'm always curious to learn about your marketing methodologies. Do you just rely on referrals mm -hmm. or do you have a marketing stack that you like that works really well for you, be it organic posting on social media or are you running, you know, Google ads, Facebook ads? What what has worked for you in to get to that 10 percent steady increase in, you know, beating or meeting your revenue goals? Yeah, we're real big on content marketing. That's our big thing. So we put a ton of effort. We write about a blog post a week, um, post it to the site, and then we'll promote that on social media. We write those project case studies we talked about. Um, and again, we'll promote those on social media. But the whole marketing strategy for us is uh, rank well organically and drive, and drive traffic to the website. We've put a lot of effort into the website to make sure it's a really good tool for our clients to understand us and to do research about remodeling in general. And so that's worked very well for us, you know, uh, you know, to date. So it's homegrown SEO that you're engaging in your yeah. teams. Yeah. Locally focused content, you know, writing content, and promoting it on social media. That's the core of our marketing platform. Um, we do a little bit of video, you know, we do a little bit of everything. We experiment with all the other stuff, but that's our, that's our real base. You know, we're never not going to do that. Right. And then just depending on what's going on, we'll experiment with, uh, Google ads or, uh, doing YouTube shorts or doing so other, you know, Pinterest ads, social, other social media. Um, uh, but those are like little experiments. We ran some TV ads for a while just to see how that goes. Uh, and that was pretty good. I would do that again. We advertise on the local NPR channel. That's a pretty consistent marketing investment for us. And it's just sort of, you know, it's baseline, staying in touch, top of mind with people. Amazing. Um, so if you were to come up with a, a number for your marketing budget, is, is that a number that you really stop and think about? Do you base it on, you know, your revenue goals or a certain percent of where your revenue is at today? Or uh, do you kind of just... Yeah. Um, so we don't set a budget and spend that budget. I mean, that's not how we look at it. I do kind of say, like, I don't want to exceed 2% of revenue. So if we start spending a bunch of money, I kind of take a, I kind of take a look and say, well, we're, we, we want to cap it at 2%. So, if, and there are some years where we've come close to that, but most years we're, we're kind of well below it um, because organic content isn't that expensive to create. Um, but, you know, we're spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $20,000 a year, probably on content um, and putting nice. it out there. It's gotten a little, it's gotten a little more expensive since the video is more expensive. So since we started doing video, uh, that's definitely gone up a bit. Um, but the video has been great to have too. We've been able to do some real fun things with mm -hmm. uh, job site video and testimonials and staff interviews and uh, stuff like that. You have some pretty excellent reviews on your Google business profile. Or do you have a plan in place to gather those reviews? Do you have the timing of the ask of when you ask the homeowner to write you a review? Or are these reviews just happening organically? Like, Do you have a, a review collection strategy in place? We do have a strategy. Some of them are organic. We essentially, every, every project we complete, <clears throat> or most we take we'll, we'll take professional photos and now we, you know, now we'll get professional video uh, 
So at the photo shoot or video shoot, you know, when we're, we're seeing the client for the first time in a couple of weeks since their project has been completed, uh, you know, we want to make sure we're happy. We try to make it as fun as we can. We usually bring them a gift. Um, and then we'll mention to them, like, you know, we'd really love a review. And then we'll send them a follow-up email with, with uh, a link to make it easy for them to schedule that review. When we get the final photos back, we pick a few of them. We'll, take some, we'll put some before-afters together. We create a little media package for them um, of their the project. Lookbook. And we'll email yeah. that to them. Yeah, a little lookbook kind of thing, digital. Nice. Um, we try to make it very shareable, so if they want to put it on their own social media, they can. Uh, and then when we, if they haven't left a review yet, when we deliver that to them, we'll do a follow-up ask for the review. Uh, and then a couple weeks after that, we'll have written our project case study. We'll email them. We send them a close of project email that just explains our follow-up process and our warranty process and what to expect. And then if they haven't left the review, we'll do a final ask there. Um, and then that's it. We don't want to pester people. So we, yep. we ask a couple of times that they don't want to leave us a review. That's fine. Um, and I would say probably probably around 40, 50 percent of our clients will leave us a review in any given year, which is fine. You know, we don't need hundreds of reviews. We're happy if we're getting a couple <clears> of new <throat> ones a month. Right. Yeah. That, that's local SEO right there for you. The Google algorithm will recognize your brand and will, you know, when people search for you, it's, it, it's going yeah, to yeah. Uh, well, show no, up. Well, number one thing people say when they call is if they haven't been to our website, a lot of people, the bane of my existence kind of is uh, Google my business. It's fantastic because, you know, you search and it pops up and it's right there and it's easy to contact. But people are calling us before they do any research. They're just calling us right from Google My Business. And the number one thing we hear from those calls is they'll say, well, how come, why did you call us? They'll say, well, you popped up when I did a search and you have five-star reviews and it looked good, so I called you. Um, and the, weirdly, those are often not the best leads because they have not done any research about who we are and what we do. The what? best leads for us are to do some research. Makes sense, yeah, because it's a commitment. Remodeling is a commitment because you know there's thousands of dollars involved. So, you know, Google yeah. Business Profile Optimization is one of my favorite things to do. I'm really passionate about it. So, one thing that you can do is you can install a trackable phone number on your profile, and then the yeah. first the first yeah. point of contact will be uh, you can immediately send them a message and kind of guide them through the process that you want them to take. So your team is not yeah. wasting time on you know, random conversations and you can kind of vet the lead and, you yeah. know, push the tire kickers out and so forth. We, we do use call rail to uh, track all our calls. So all our, all our incoming calls are recorded and we track that stuff. I never really thought about sending them a message uh, in advance. Yeah. My, philosoph my philosophy has always been, I want to talk to me. We have someone who answers, who's, her job is to answer the phones, but um, we want them to call. I don't care if you, call and you want to buy a toilet. We don't sell toilets. I still want you to call because I want to provide you a positive experience with our For brand. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then maybe a year from now, you remember us when you do a remodel. Uh, right. So we, we kind of encourage the calls. We're not getting overwhelmed with calls. You know what I mean? It's totally manageable. Um, but it's a little frustrating that these people are find, finding us on, I wish there was a way to get, a little more information in that Google My Business profile to help people understand exactly what we do. But it's a pretty limited, you know, box there that you get. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a good it's problem to have. Yeah, it's improved over the years. The profile has become pretty robust. There's a lot of things you can uh, put in there. I, I didn't really look at your profile with the fine tooth comb. But, yeah, there's, there's tons of things that you can do on it to, you know, find that optimal lead that matches the ideal keywords, the kitchen and bathroom and, you know, oh. uh, project value and so forth. So I mean, if you get a chance to take a look, I'd love, I'd love yeah, to see sure. what we could be doing different because it's yeah. great that so many people see it, but it's terrible that so many people, you know, they call us looking for something we don't really provide because yep. they didn't know enough about us. Do you engage in any text marketing? No, I'm not. I hate text. Like I don't like getting texts from, you know, so I, I kind too. of, I don't like text for me is more private than email. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can cold email me and that's okay. If you cold <laughs> text me, 
You know, you're losing you're my gonna, business. I don't appreciate gonna, it. You're going to block me. So I've always shied away from it for that reason. Now, if a client gives us permission, then, of course, we will engage with them through text. But um, there was I don't a, like doing a lot of text. Today, anybody cannot text. If you're receiving any text campaigns, there's an entire verification process that marketing agencies need to go through before we can text market for our clients. And this was because of a yeah. lawsuit that happened in the United States. And so every phone number that we buy for text marketing needs to be, it's called A to P 10 DLC application to person 10 digit long code verification. So if the number is not verified, it's yeah. not even going to make it onto the phone. So I think that way, in some ways, America being a, Litigious society is helpful to, to 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 humanity and society, so we're not just like bombarded with messages. So um, it's become way more yeah. tedious. So I was just curious to hear your your take on text marketing. So if there is yeah, a brand new, I'm old. Go ahead. You're I'm you're not. I'm an old. Guy. I'm still resistant to it. But, <laughs> so you'd you rather know. hear from no, your friends I, and family on your text and not be marketed to. Yeah, text for me is very unique. I use text for very specific reasons, and I don't want to hear from <laughs> other people. But you know, as time goes on, more and more people are going to be open to texting. So I'm sure that will change over time. As the younger people buy houses and get into remodeling, a lot of them do prefer being contacted by text. So yeah, we, we deploy text campaigns for my contractors and it does really well because like you say, it's that age range, you know, the millennials and the age range of the people that, uh, you know, want, want to have that at the palm of your hands because everybody has a phone sewn to their bodies these days. So, you know, if you're able oh, yeah. to do a bunch of actions from your phone, sure, why not? Um, if there was a brand new contractor that was just starting in the remodeling industry, considering you're a veteran, you've been at this for so many years, what would be like little nuggets of wisdom that you would share? Would it be a, a favorite book? Did you have a mentor or what would you uh, oh, yeah. recommend them to do? The hard thing about being new is you don't have the money to do the things you need to do. <laughs> right. I would say 100% if you're still starting, just starting out, hire a coach. You know, and there's some good ones out there. But when you're first starting out, you probably don't have money to, <laughs> to hire a coach. Did you hire a coach? So Do you that, have a favorite favorite contractor coach that yeah. you like working with? I do. I worked. I don't. We don't work together anymore because he's his sort of wheelhouse is taking people from kind of the just starting out the one man show and helping them grow into a you know a, a business where they where they have staff and they're and then and then. He, you know, so I kind of, we kind of outgrew each other, but he's a fantastic guy. His name's Kyle, um, Kyle Hunt. And he's still around. He's so, still in business. Yeah, he runs a great Facebook group called Remodelers Community. I see. Um, that's just fantastic. It's full of people just sharing tips. And I get a lot of great advice and ideas from that forum. But yeah, Kyle's great. I would recommend Kyle to anybody. But if you're starting, you know, when I started out on my own, I couldn't afford a coach. The book that probably had the biggest impact for me is a book by Michael Stone called Markup and Profit. And Ooh. it's really, it's just all about knowing your numbers and how to figure out how to charge appropriately for your services. Understanding right. your overhead costs, you know, and being able to charge appropriately for those, how to do proper estimating uh, and think about all of the things that need to be included in an estimate. And so that was a game changer for me because really once you start charging appropriately, then the door, then now you can, the door is open. You can start to afford marketing services. You can start to afford coaching services. And then you start to realize, oh, I get how this works. Like I need, I just can't charge $30 an hour and make $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. I need more money to invest in my business in order to help it make it grow. And it's sort of just, you know, the number one rule is make more money, like start charging more and start banking money so you can invest that money back into the business. Right. Um, and the, then I think the that, second. Okay. No, I said it, it's a mindset no, to be a, it's a mindset to be able to charge more to charge what you're worth. You know, it's a, when you're an entrepreneur, it yeah. takes a bit of time for you to land at that, you know, that sweet spot. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a, certainly a mindset shift that I think once you make it, things start to change in a big way. Um, the second book that really made a difference for me was a book called Profit First yes. um, by Michael, Michael Michalowicz. And yes. that's just really, it's a cash flow management yep. uh, system um, that we still use today. That's fantastic. 
Did you uh, open up your four I, accounts? Did you open I up do, your yeah, four? I, 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 I probably have six accounts. Like we kind of, we've kind of customized it a little bit to our needs, but the core idea of, you know, whatever your profit, net profit goal is 10%, let's say you take that 10% first and you stick it somewhere out of sight. And if you can't run your business on the remaining 90%, then you know, you're doing something wrong. Yep. You, you, know, you have to fix something. Um, that was just really great. And it's helped us, you know, and then bucketing, saving for taxes in advance, saving mm -hmm. for investment in the company in advance, saving for, you know, having a contingency fund for if things do go wrong, you know, all those things have been great. Yep. Um, I'm a, and I'm yeah, a huge. You do that for years and you, then suddenly you look at your bank account and you're like, man, I'm in a great position. Like <laughs> things you could feel... go terrible for, you know, quite a few months and I would survive. And then that feels really good. Yep. yep. I, I'm a huge fan of profit first as well. I've, I've been a long time entrepreneur and I have those accounts set up and notated percents that you're supposed to put away and then i diligently move the money around and like you say it's just this yeah. you're suddenly you you have this freedom the brain bandwidth of like not worrying about money anymore because you can exactly see where your all your dollars yeah. are sitting and it's just liberating to to do profit first yeah very powerful instead of, instead of buying a new truck and having to make payments for four years you know <clears throat> you have the cash to go buy the truck you know and that's yeah that's a much much different thing you know? Yeah, yeah, very true. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. AI is such a big deal today. Everybody's talking about Chat GPT and Gemini and the Zim Writer. And are you a fan of AI? Do you use any tools in your day-to-day -day business? Um, what's your overall take on AI? Uh, yeah. So we're big. Uh, we use a lot for copywriting. So writing blog content, website content. That's a pretty <clears throat> easy use case. Um, I've started using it to create quizzes from our mm -hmm. SOPs. So you can upload an SOP and it'll create a quiz. And that's been pretty useful for training new staff. But I also bring up the quiz at every staff meeting and just quiz everyone on, you know, existing SOPs. Uh, and that's been very useful just to reinforce, you know, best practices. You know, we all, like every business, you do things right for a while. And then for some reason, suddenly... People don't follow the procedure and things start to get a little <laughs> off track. We have to always come back and reinforce the procedure. And this is why we do it. And the quizzes have been real good for that. But AI mostly, I'm mostly just excited to see what happens with it in the future. I feel like there's just, you know, there's not a ton of use cases for us right now. But I feel like in the next three, four or five years, there's going to be a lot. Uh, I'm looking more and more people seem to be integrating it into existing software, which I think is the best use of it. Um, so once we start seeing more of it integrated into project management software, integrated into estimating software, integrated into CRMs, yep. I think that's where it becomes real powerful when it becomes a little more user-friendly. And instead of me having to take something, put it into ChatGPT, it's just built into the thing I'm using. And I can just say, hey, generate this report for me, yep. write this thing for me. So I think I think I'm excited about that more than anything. But what you're asking for is trying to replace the human brain, right? Which which might which might be a long ask because ultimately it's all about the prompting. When you think about like these AI tools, the smarter the prompt yeah. is, the better the results are, and the smarter or not smart comes from your brain. So um, it, yeah, yeah the prompting but, is important. Yep, it, it's interesting. Yep. There are CRMs. I Go ahead. Like, Hub, like HubSpot has a, a use case now where, you know, you have all your marketing data inside of HubSpot and you want to run a report, let's say, you know, what's the ROI on your three different marketing channels? How are they performing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can do that on your own. It might take a minute to put all that together and generate that report. But now they're doing that with AI where you can just say, hey, what's the ROI of my paid social media channel correct and it will just give you the report it's doing that work for you yeah um that's the kind of stuff i'm excited about streamlining you know the process we write you know we write two or three daily logs every day on every project i see and that's great then at the end of the project we write uh, uh what we call a job audit it's a summary of the project what went well what went didn't and we review that i would you know if you could use an ai tool to summarize all of your daily logs and pick out 
the challenges and write that report for you, that would be very powerful. Yep. yep. You know, so uh, are you, stuff like that is what I'm kind of excited. Are you familiar with the tool called High Level? It's a CRM. No, 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 yeah. yeah. So the Go High Level has the capability right now to be integrated with ChatGPT, and you can build out what is called a custom GPT. So I can actually build out a Paul McManus GPT and have the GPT sound like you and respond to every lead that comes in, in your language, in your, your voice. So people feel like they're speaking with the owner of the, of the business. So that's one of the things that we do for my uh, contractor clients, where we build out these custom GPTs and help them convert leads into booked appointments. And that tool is just getting better and better with time because of the integrations and the customizations that are possible. And, um, you know, with every bot, there's a little bit of hallucination errors that happen, but it's becoming fewer and far between sure. that it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm just excited about the, the possibility of how that bot can really, you know, um, literally leave no lead unconverted, right? That's, that's the possibility of, um, yeah, the bot. Yeah, that's powerful. If you can get, if you can get some automatic responses that sound personal, that sound like you. Yeah. Yeah. So the custom GPTs are, are working great and it's one of my passions. I, I do play quite a bit with it. Um, well, I saved the best for the last. So tell me a little bit about your, okay. about your personal life. What do you do for fun? And then I also read about how many countries you've traveled and you're not just a traveler who hops on a plane and goes and stays in a resort and sightsees. Like it's incredible what I read. So I'll let you say it in your own words about your bicycle expeditions and the continents that you've traversed. So I'd love to learn more about you on your personal side. Yeah, uh, I don't, I travel less these days. I'm more focused on the business, I can but I have been fortunate to, um, you know, it's a trade-off. In my youth, I spent a lot of time traveling and doing kind of fun things, but I didn't make a lot of money. It's okay. <laughs> and, and then I reached, I reached a certain age and I started thinking, okay, I'm going to need some money someday and uh, got a little more serious about the business. But, you know, travel, you know, changes the way I think about everything. I think everyone <laughs> should spend a lot, you know, as much time as I can traveling, especially to other countries. Mm -hmm. And, uh, especially countries that aren't similar to ours. Like you can go to England, you can go to Germany and they're, yeah. they're going to be a lot, very, very similar to America. But if you start going to, uh, you know, less well-known places, you're going to have a much, you're going to, it's much more mind opening. I think it's much better experience. So I got very lucky and I was asked to join a bicycle tour company uh, based out of Toronto, Canada that does, uh, something very unique. They do cross continental bicycle tours. So there's, there's lots of bicycle tour companies. They do two week, three week, four week tours in different places. These guys do three month, four month long tours wow. and they're always crossing a continent. So my first tour with them was Cairo to Cape town. So North to South mm -hmm. through Africa. It goes through 10, 10 or 12 different countries in Africa. Um, we did Shanghai, to Istanbul wow. uh, with that company, which is across China and then through a bunch of the stands and then through Iran and, and then eventually winds up in Turkey. Um, so that's where I got a lot of, like as far as ticking off numbers of countries to see and seeing some pretty unique places, um, that's where a lot of that came from. And that was, I did that for four, four or five years and that was pretty fantastic. How, how does it feel though? Like waking up and going on a bike ride is one thing, but writing for four months like does it all kind of just you know so yeah, you write yeah. and then you sleep and then you wake up and you write and i think writing is kind of fun because you're not walking so you're not tired you probably you know but you still have the same stimulus and interaction with your surroundings because you're not racing in an automobile or a bus but does, does it get yeah. old or how does it feel like when you're biking for four months it's like you said, bicycling is great for travel, I feel like, because you're going fast enough that you see lots of things, but you're going slow enough that you really get to experience those things. And you stop to talk to people and you interact with your environment versus being on a plane or a bus or in a car. You're driving by so much stuff and you don't even realize it until you get to the next hotel or the next you know, destination. Uh, cycling through places is very gritty. Um, mm -hmm. It's 
a real adventure. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And the thing about adventure is most adventure, you know, it sucks. While you're doing it, adventure can be pretty terrible. You know, it can be hard, sweaty, dirty. If you're traveling through Africa, you're definitely getting sick, mm -hmm. you know, at least two or three times because there's uns I know, unsanitary conditions in a lot of countries. You know, in Ethiopia, the kids throw rocks at you because they, they just, that's what they like to do. So you're oh, getting no. hit with rocks all the time. You know what I mean? You're climbing hills, you're sleeping on rough ground, you know, but at the end of the day, when it's all over, it's, you know, there's no better experience. It's pretty fantastic. So amazing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it up for the world. Did you do you this? Know? Did you do the same route more than a couple of times or more than one time? Or did you? Um... Yeah, I did Kyra to Cape Town three times, I think, and Istanbul to uh, Shanghai twice. Um, the others I did, the other, everything else I did once. There's one that goes through Russia. We did one that goes to the Eastern Bloc countries. We did, we did one across North America, actually. That was still, you know, felt like home, but was still very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so is there a certain skill level that these bikers need to have to go on this trip or anybody can? I mean, if you can, if you can sit on a bike for six or seven hours a day, you're pretty much, you're welcome. you know, you have the skill. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. But the better, yeah, the better your fitness level, the more, you know, yeah. the better cyclist for you are, sure. the better your fitness level, of course, you're going to have a better time. But, you know, the, the nice thing is it's four months. So even if you're not fit at the start, you're going to be fit <laughs> by the mid, by midway. You know, there's no choice. You're going to be leaner, you know? leaner, whether you like it or not, with all of that biking. Yeah. yeah. Everyone loses weight. But, you know, some guys show up and they're already excellent cyclists. I'm sure. A lot of people show up and they're, you know they're in good shape, but they're not really in the kind of shape they need to be. But in in a month, you're, you know, you're naturally going to get there. So nice. So today, what do you do for fun? I, you know, with your today family. I work. Oh come That's on. That's what I do for fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't do. I really don't. I'm a boring. I'm a boring guy. <laughs> the life is kind of, you know, <laughs> life is kind of in phases for me. Either I'm doing, I'm kind of on off. Mm -hmm. I'm either working and I don't do much else. Uh, I mean, you know, I hang out with friends, I go out, you know, to movies, I do normal things. But uh, right now, when if I have a couple, if I have an afternoon on a Saturday where I don't have anything to do, it sounds weird, but I like sitting down and writing a blog post or updating the website or, you know, <laughs> focusing on some other part of the business. That's what I like to do with my free time right now. It's just what I'm focused on. It's, I, 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 um, you know, that'll change. You know. Completely resonate. Yeah, you can be easily become a twenty four seven entrepreneur because you're so passionate about your brand, and you know you, you just want it to do well and serve your clients. And I know the feeling of how you feel like you just work, work, yeah. work, working. I said for me, as long as it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. You know, if I'm enjoying, if I'm enjoying it, it's not work. Right. You know what I mean. Right. And when it becomes when it becomes work, when it becomes if I have to have discipline and force myself to sit down to do these things. Yes. That's when, for me, it becomes a problem. That's when I know I need to do something else. Yep. But as long as I'm sitting down and enjoying it, and I want to do it. You know, it's just as fun as you know mm -hmm. anything else. You know, and there's there's seasons to everything, and a couple of years that will change. Yes. And I'll hire someone to run the business while I go maybe on the next adventure. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. You, adventure so, is at the core of you. It's in your heart, considering you've done these you know, bicycle expedition. So it's, it's going to come back. That spark is in you. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's almost a little, like it's difficult for me to go on a two week vacation mm -hmm. because I'm so used to going on multi-month long. <laughs> vacation. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm so cool. I take a four month break, half a year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> two weeks but, stop to the head. Yeah. You know, I go on a week vacation. It's like, well, I just left and now I'm already back. It doesn't feel as satisfying. So cool. I'm always looking for opportunities to go somewhere and do something for a long period of time. Nice. You know? Nice. Um, so I really appreciate your time and chatting with me and dealing with all of these tech issues. If there's a contractor who's trying to make up their mind whether to be on this podcast or not, what would you tell them? What was the conversation style? Did you enjoy hanging out? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, you're a great interviewer. Um, and I've loved the experience. It's been fun. No, I've been on a few different podcasts. No one's, 
no one's done the research to ask me about my cycling experience before I dive into that stuff. So you obviously put your, your work in I, and it's been very enjoyable. Yep. I absolutely love spending time on my guests and, you know, understanding your background so I can bring value to my listeners. So this was an absolute delight. I really appreciate your time and sharing all of this. If you would like to generate more leads through your digital marketing efforts, please visit remodelerdigital.com and check the workshop section for video training and guides on everything from running effective pay-per-click ads and how to have your website be best friends with the Google algorithm. Also sign up for a 15-minute discovery call with me to run an online snapshot report of your remodeling business. This has been another successful episode of the Remodeler Digital Playbook. Thanks for listening.